the first thing and the very basic thing is to get started. Don't hide. Every American has a responsibility to move the nation forward on this issue. Silence is hostility toward this work. You cannot hide. You cannot be silent. What can we do to ensure systemic long-term change? We have to dare to imagine boldly. We have to be creative. We have to freedom dream, as Robin Kelly would say. Begin to think differently about how you and I can be together, right? How we can live together where we don't be, where we're not mysteries to one another, right? Bold thinking is what is required for systemic change. Um, risk, as the, as the activists would say, we got to risk everything right now, right here, right now, right here. That's what I think will be the, the basis of, of long-term change. I'm so grateful that you've chosen to spend the next hour with us. Today, we're gonna to launch our first of a five-part action series with a discussion on the need for audacious leadership to create the change that we all so desperately need to be a just and an equitable America. When we founded E Pluribus Unum in 2018, we did so with the idea to fulfill America's promise of justice and opportunity for all. We have to break down the barriers and the systems that have divided us for generations we created the Truth Action Reconciliation Series with this belief in mind. We started with conversations around the truth of our past and the systems that were purposely created to divide us. Today, we begin with the action conversations, focusing on the good work that folks are doing to change systems and to inspire us to explore other ways to participate in creating the America we all want and deserve. Once again, we will cover criminal justice, health equity, economic equity and democracy in our topics. Real transformative change begins with leadership and around the issues of race and equity, it takes leaders who are audacious, who are focused, who are undeterred. And that is our topic for discussion today. It is such an incredible privilege to welcome our panelists, Mr. Jeff Rakes, co-founder of the Rakes Foundation and the former CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Honorable LeVar Stoney, Mayor of Richmond, Virginia, and one of our nation's great leaders. And our conversation today will be moderated by Lejeune Montgomery Tebron, who is the President and CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, who has been leading in the philanthropic space for so many years on this critical topic. I'm so happy to be with you today and to be able to join the conversation. And so now, Lejeune, I turn it over to you. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Mitch, and I'm honored to be here to moderate this conversation today. Audacious leadership is a subject that is very near and dear to my heart and the work at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And yes, leadership creates change and audacious leadership sustains change. And so let's pick up this conversation, starting right where the truth conversation left off. Uh, the first conversation on truth, I just have to commend the Pluribus Unum on a great grounding to then now today talk about what audacious leadership can do for racial equity in this nation and the world. So let's start out with Dr. Glaude. He ended uh, the truth session saying that we can ensure systemic and long-term change and what we need to do is imagine boldly to have and be creative and to freedom dream. I want to ask each of you, do you agree with the statement made by Dr. Glaude? And where do you think we are in this moment as it relates to audacious leadership and the opportunity that we have? I'll start uh, with Jeff. Great. Well, thank you very much, Lejeune and Mitch. It's a great pleasure to be with with all of you as well. I, I absolutely agree with Dr. Cloud. I, we have a real opening right now. You know, I worked at the Gates Foundation for many years, Microsoft Marine for many years. System change is complicated. It's hard. Sometimes it's very de demoralizing. It can take a, a long time. It requires sustained energy. But in the wake of George Floyd, 
What we're seeing in the streets, what we're seeing in the polling, more and more white people are waking up. Uh, and the, the reality is it's not just police violence problem, it's a long-standing structural systemic racist, racism problem. And so what we need is a wide cross-section. We need communities and sectors coming together. And frankly, Ujun, I'm very heartened by what I'm seeing in terms of, you know, especially with business leaders expressing support. I've had conversations with leaders of the business roundtable, and they're doing the hard work of figuring out how companies can contribute. And then you're seeing professional athletes, you're seeing media, you're seeing clergy, you're seeing folks in rural communities. I grew up in a small farming community in Nebraska. They had protesters uh, out there. What we need to do is we need to come together across communities and sectors and figure out these anti-racist policies, find the best practices, scale them, and ensure government at all levels, all levels, are bringing about the, the uh, conditions so that we have a more just America. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mayor Stoney, do you agree with uh, the need for audacious leadership and uh, creative and bold leadership at this time? Lejeune, absolutely. I think um, you take roles like mayor not to come to uh, come into office and just push paper. I think we are tasked with pushing the envelope. And I think Mitch can speak to this as well, is that a lot of uh, elected officials uh, can become very, they, they, they it's they become very reluctant in pushing the envelope because there's always an election coming around the corner. However, uh, I believe that you have to have a compass when you get into this sort of work, and the compass has to be pointed to the direction of doing the right thing, no matter what. And so in my time as mayor, I've, uh, well, I guess I'm known for now, like Mitch is as well, in removing uh, racist Confederate monuments. Um, I've also talked about how we go about funding public education and funding housing and whatnot. And sometimes the dollars aren't there uh, in your budget. So you're going to find new ways to raise these dollars. And that means sometimes asking the people to do a little bit more. But it's always for the right thing. If, the, if your heart's in the right place and you got the right plan, I say, you know what, go out there and sell the plan and be bold and audacious in doing so. People want leadership, right? They don't want leadership that is uh, hesitant or that is uh, calculated. They want people to lead with their heart, be bold, and be audacious, all for the right reasons. And that's the sort of leadership I think we need right now, particularly in this summer of fighting against injustices and whatnot. It's going to take a lot of hard work to root out systemic uh, systemic racism and systemic injustices that we have in our system. And we, we have to do that in housing, in public education, in health care. So Dr. Glad is absolutely correct. We need that sort of leadership now more than ever. Thank you, Mayor Stoney. Mitch, what, is, what does this mean? And, and then a follow-up question for you. You've been courageous and you've used that courage to make a difference. Talk about how you chose to step into that moment and the choice that you made to lead. Thank you for thank you for the question, and 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 again, thank all of you for joining us and, and giving us the benefit of your wisdom and your experience in this space. You know, I I, I want to make a couple of comments. First of all, uh, it should go without saying, um, although we have to repeat it to ourselves time and time again, that leadership really matters. Uh, from time to time, every leader of an organization, if they're listening. Uh, to their stakeholders, whether they're constituents or shareholders or customers. If you, if you dare to listen, um, you will learn things that it's hard for you to see when you're sitting in the C-suite 40,000 feet up. Um, good leaders try to find a way to help organizations be integral, be uh, integrated and live with integrity. You know, in other words, what are our principles? Um, how do we want to behave and do our actions respond to that. In the United States of America, as you know, um, at our infancy, at our birth, we declared that all men are created equal. Uh, that was the social commitment that we made to ourselves. But when we made that commitment, we actually knew that it, that was really a hypocritical statement. And, and uh, racism has been this nation's Achilles heel from the beginning. And so when we start talking about institutional racism, a lot of white people here, I'm calling you specifically a racist, 
And they say, no, I'm not a racist because I was nice to the nice African-American gentleman I saw walking across the street, you know, um, and, and when you say, but it's institutionally biased, what is that? Um, as Jeff said, white people now are waking up to this notion and this idea that, of course, has been spoken about forever. And uh, Dr. Galau talked particularly about Jimmy Baldwin, who is was prescient, you know, back in the day. Um, and so I think it, it is should go without saying that if all of that is bubbling up from the ground and the people who are leaders don't incent that to continue or sit down or get in the way or create a disincentive for that to happen, it's a lot harder for all of that truth to come up. So that's why it's critically important, especially for um, the leaders of the organizations in our country to say, not only is it okay, but I, the leader, am actually going to push this forward and incent everybody in this organization to lean into this space, to see what they can see, know what they can know. And if that doesn't happen, it just gets much harder. You actually see this now on a national political level with the president actually pushing back, denying institutional racism, stopping the, the, the discussions of diversity through the federal government. Well, that's the wrong kind of leadership. What you want is a leader who says, you know what? This is a really critical problem. It's been with us for a long time. For a lot of different reasons, there is a moment here that we need to seize and push our country forward dramatically faster and further than we thought we could go two years ago because of the convergence of events that maybe nobody could predict. So let's step into it and move. That's what I would consider to be bold and audacious leadership. Now, as a, in a normal basis, we ought to be doing that anyway. And that ought, to become, that ought to be normalized behavior, but because it's so risky and because it's so scary and so it, it's so unclear, um, that is why all of us are working together to get people to see it more clearly, to understand it, to know it. And now once you know it, you say to them, well, now you know it, what are you gonna do now? And how are we gonna use your power to move forward? And how can we make it um, something that we incentivize as a country rather than punish and so when I was the mayor of the city, I was, you know, I was trying to rebuild the city. You know, Katrina beat us to death. I mean, literally 1,800 of our fellow Americans were killed. 500,000 homes were hurt. 250,000, you know, were, were, were damaged almost beyond repair. And um, we had to rebuild the city. And the question was, how are you going to build it? You're going to put it back just like it was? Because, you know, in an emergency, everybody just wants to act like nothing happened. We want to just get back to normal until people start saying, well, wait a minute, what was that normal? Was that really a good state of affairs? I don't want to go back to that because that wasn't good for me anyway. Let's think about how to build it better if we would have gotten it right the first time. And in order to do that, you have to use the power that you have to uh, make sure that the organization is actually living with integrity. And um, that, of course, needs to be true not only in government, on the federal level, um, across you know, the judiciary, the legislative and the executive branch, but it has to be true on the state level, has to be true on the local level. And then that is particularly um, not enough if the business community basically says, well, we're not going to pay attention either because that's where most of the jobs are. Uh, same thing is true about higher education. Same thing is true about how it filters down to high schools and then health care and all of those things. So it's got to, there's got to be an intersection of, of, of um, moving forward across all of those platforms. And we all have to be in that space voluntarily, happily, with boldness and with courage. And then this country will leap, leap into a future that I think is, is, is really, really struggling to be born um, with a lot of people trying to make sure that that doesn't happen and a lot of people demanding that it happen quicker. Thank you, Mitch, and uh, you made some very key points there, uh, the power that you have and stepping into the power you have as leaders. And Jeff, I'd like to turn to you now because I think about our sector, philanthropy, and, um, you know, it's, we've been under scrutiny lately, and uh, some say that philanthropy is filled with white dominance. Um, and so how do you and your leadership uh, within philanthropy advance racial equity? And how have you advanced this conversation and what have you learned in your process? You're on mute, Jeff. 
Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, thank you, Lejeune. It's a it's a very very important point. I I I've looked at the criticism of our sector. I think it's very good. I internalize it. I actually do think that the sector has been filled with a lot of white dominance, and that's because if you look at the the creators of the the wealth that then put the wealth into philanthropy, it's it it is very white dominance, and that's inspired us to be critical of ourselves and make changes, make changes in the way Trisha and I work. You know, there's much ground to cover on this topic, but I'm gonna give you three points. Number one starts with staff, leadership diversity. Uh, that is incredibly important. If you have white staff, if you have organizations that you fund who are white, if you hire white consultants, you're gonna get the ideas from white people. And that is a problem. So one of the key steps that we took was to dramatically diversify our staff. That was extremely important because our aspiration was to be equity centered. A second thing that I think is very important is we're seeing the shift of who is at the table and what solutions are being funded. It used to be mostly white people with fancy degrees and sitting in those rooms. And I know because I was in those rooms. And, and, and it's fair to say, yes, they really cared about solving the problems, but they didn't have the lived experience. I don't have the lived experience. And so we need people at the table shaping uh, strategies who have that uh, lived experience. And, and frankly, the ones who are already out in the community doing great work. And a third thing that I think is very important is the recent shift, which is very much aligned with the, the protests that have led to more people in philanthropy funding organizing, especially youth organizing. And I think if you look back at the history of making substantive, sustainable change for our country, the power of organizers and activists has been proven in terms of changing laws and systems. One of the examples I saw recently is the Susan Sandler Foundation just announced this week, $220 million going to primarily the South and Southeast to fund uh, organizers and, and activists because Susan recognizes that if we're going to change the policies, if we're going to have an inclusive democracy, we're gonna have to invest in these organizations in order to build that. Legit, may I, may I just, just, if you Please. look at the numbers of, if you look at all the philanthropic dollars that are distributed in America from all the philanthropic organizations and you look at where that money is spent, um, you will find that a very large portion of it is spent outside of the lower 13 Southern states where there's uh, not the only pockets of poverty but the greatest pockets of poverty and disparities. 56% of African-Americans live in the lowest 13 Southern states. And if you just look at the distribution, it's not unlike venture capital funds that if you look at where those are distributed, it's mostly on the West Coast, on the East Coast, um, and it follows similar patterns uh, from that perspective. So I'm really thrilled to hear that philanthropy is actually looking at those metrics and asking themselves whether or not we're targeting our resources where the greatest need is. And I thank you, Jeff, for that. Yes, and Jeff, thank you, because those are very practical uh, actions that philanthropies can take. And I just wanted to add one, uh, as you were speaking mm -hmm. about staff, I want to back that up and talk about boards uh, and both making the connection between philanthropic boards and corporate boards as well, because I think your governance structure is what gives that authorizing environment for staff to act and to be bold in their actions because they know that they're gonna be backed up by a strong governance process. And I think, you know, to your point, Mitch, of where funding goes, that governance has a lot to do with that. So where there's the purview of people in the governing role that understand uh, the dynamics and where uh, the need is, uh, that will guide the resources as well. I want to shift a little bit for all of us because we've been watching leadership happen, particularly in the streets of our great cities and communities. Uh, and we've, we've been watching hundreds of protests around the police brutality and the blatantness of, of comments uh, 
going back and forth between leaders across the country. What kind of leaders do you think we need in this moment um, where we're seeing all expressions, both racist expressions, as well as those who are demanding equality? What kind of leadership do you need in this moment and for the next generation? And I'll start with uh, Mayor Stoney. Well, June, I think that first, um, any sort of uh, racism should be, we, we should be rooting that out of all of our systems. I mean, that's, that's what I, I've heard uh, the, from the protesters uh, who've been walking the streets of the city of Richmond. That's what I've heard on the CNNs and the MSNBCs is that it's time we have an opportunity to reckon with this issue of race, right? This is the issue that unfortunately, this has been a cloud over our nation's head for, for far too long. And there are, there's a generation out there who believe, and, I, and here's the thing, I appreciate and support that optimism, believe that we can get it right. But here's the deal. I know that with that urgent need, people believe that it needs to happen today. And there are certain things that can happen today, but I think Mitch recognizes this as well, that we are in, a, a, in government, there are systems, and we have to play through, play the game of legislative process and the, uh, the administrative process as well. And what I've done is you do everything what you, you can do in your purview and in your power. However, sometimes this it takes a little while, but we have to stay committed. And I will say this, uh, we f I find too many leaders today in government, uh, whether it's in activism or where those who are in elected office, that everything has now become, because of our countries being so polarized, everything has become a zero-sum game. This is the last... that we. At this time, more now than ever, we don't need a zero-sum approach to rooting out systemic racism. I'm always going to be a supporter of those who believe in progress. I might not get the full 100 yards today, but you know what? If I get 75 of those yards, I'll take the first down and, and many more. We're going to score the touchdown one day, right? right? But I find on both the left and the right is this zero-sum approach. But what has that gotten us? What has that gotten us as a country? We are here today in 2020 because I think of the last couple of decades of this zero sum game. In order for me to win, mean, that means that you have to lose. Why not find ways that we all can win? Now, is that gonna be pleasing to everyone? No. My grandmother who raised me said, honey, you're not gonna please 100% of the people 100% of the time. And that's what sometimes we face as mayors is that we are the individuals who have to we have to call it straight, right? You know, in, in my city, I've had protesters who've said that I'm pro-police and I've had police officers or those who support police say I'm pro-protester because I've been critical of both sides, I've been critical of both sides. So to me, we have to find, uh, we have to find a compromise. I know compromise is a, a bad word. We should do what's right. If something's racist and wrong, you have to write that. Mm -hmm. That's just, there's no excuses. But as we, as we write those wrongs, we have to understand that it's, it can't be zero sum. Thank you, and I appreciate that. I'm just going to ask you a follow-up question in that regard. As you're building those coalitions, uh, knowing that there are going to be leaders of different points of view, how do you build uh, those coalitions and make that space for leadership to come together and create the kind of change that we're talking about? together, not in a zero sum approach. Now, this is, I think um, it's nature of our nature is to surround ourselves with folks who, who think the way we think, who believe what we believe. But even in my time as mayor, you have to, I've come to grips with the fact that you have to create uh, some uncomfortable spaces for yourself, right? You have to have people in the room who don't believe exactly the same thing you believe in. You know, right now I have a, a task force uh, for reimagining policing, reimagining public safety. And I remember at the press conference, I stated that I have folks on this uh, task force who, who believe the opposite of what I believe. But we need to have those discussions. You know, I have, uh, I think it's an asset in my city is that, you know, we have a, a history that is both good, bad, and ugly. And uh, I created a, uh, an alliance of a coalition of business interests and historians and activists and, and academics to talk about how what do we do with 
a, a slave burial site in my in my downtown region in, in Chaco Bottom, and it were people from who have different ideas, uh, a different vision for the for the property. But it took all of us coming together to get to a, a vision that we all can share. Did everybody win? No. But at least we're going to have something that we can share, not just with our city, but with the world as well. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we all want. We all want the same thing. We may want it in, in a different flavor. We want, may want it to be even bolder, but we're going to get to a place that we can all agree, agree upon one vision. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Stoney. Mitch, I want to turn to you. We were having a conversation earlier about the role for white America in this conversation. And what we were saying is, you know, white Americans are realizing the need to acknowledge and engage and, and act on these issues. How can white Americans step up in this moment and become allies as we look at this course and begin to correct our nation and it's create been, a, a better future? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, just a couple of points on leadership, and then I'll address that issue. First of all, you do not have to be the president, vice president, treasurer, or secretary of your organization, whether it's a community, neighborhood organization, to be a leader. You, you have to, in your own personal space, advocate in a way, whether you in the hair salon, whether you're in the barbershop, whether you're in the locker room, when you're with like the most comfortable group of people and somebody speaking out of turn on the issue of race, you can be a leader by saying, you know what? We don't do that anymore. That's, that's, that's important. The second thing is um, racism is a social construct. Uh, it was created as a social construct and it is taught by parents who teach their children. It is a learned behavior and it becomes enculturated. And if that's true, it can be unlearned and it can be relearned a different way. And we have to teach ourselves how to do that. But in order to, in order to do that, you kind of have to look at yourself and say, gosh, I didn't even notice that I did that. I didn't realize. Well, now we're gonna you know, help folks realize. And that's important. The third thing in what LaVar said, we have to learn how to speak to each other in tough but civil ways so that we can get to a constructive solution. We don't, in the civic conversations we have now, whether we're talking about race or governments big or small or left or right, we kind of yell at each other and then we go in our separate directions and there's no stick to itiveness commitment to find a constructive pathway forward. And I think we have to relearn how to do that um, aside from the issue of race, but particularly <laughs> when we speak to this issue, because it's one that is so uncomfortable and recognize in a humble way that we don't know how to do it well. And, and it's a fearful place for many people to be because we just haven't practiced it well. And we have to, in that sense, go through it. Um, particularly for white people, I can offer this to the white people of America. As you know, E. Basunum traveled across the South. Uh, we went to 13 lower southern states. We went to, I think, 31 different counties. We talked to 1,000 people to get a, to listen and to get a real sense from white people and black people, young and old, what they were thinking. We learned from listening that most white people don't understand or profess not to know or deny the notion of institutional racism and bias, and they think it's just an indi individual act of malice. African-American community sees us very differently and, and, in my opinion, are completely right that they, they, the reason that we don't have generational wealth and disparate you know, incomes and the kind of differences we have in outcomes that are critically important, maternal deaths, infant mortality, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and the disparate impact that you have from COVID um, all comes from an inability because of institutional biases to build generational wealth. And those things need to change. Now, the other thing that is clearly true, if white people talk to anybody they might know who is a person of color and they and they are in a comfortable space, what you will hear is from an African American community's perspective, and this is not universally true, but it is mostly true because African American community is not monolithic and diverse as well. But I am so tired of having to explain to white people something they should know. 
please stop asking me to explain it to you. There's enough information out there for you to educate yourself about that. I'm exhausted. So Charles Barkley said this the other day, and I think I'm paraphrasing, but I'm quitting places. It's, it's exhausting to be black. And by the way, I think that's what he said. And by the way, um, we don't have the power to change it. So it, it, only the people in power can change it on an institutional level. And then you ask the next, but you have to ask the next question. Well, who is in power? And this is an easily knowable and answerable thing. You can go on the internet right now and just, I'll take you through a little bit real quick. The president of the United States is white. Vice president is white. Uh, most of the Supreme Court is white. Most of the Senate, United States Senate and most of Congress is exponentially white and mostly male. All 50 governors are white. The 7,463 legislators that, that, that run the 50 states in America are 80% white and male. Um, if you think about the sheriffs, the DAs, then, then let's just jump over to the business side. Jeff and, and, and I were talking earlier about the business roundtable. If you look at all the Fortune 500 companies and you ask yourself how many leaders of those companies that run tech, business, the people that run the Federal Reserve, um, I think there were only three Fortune 500 CEOs since 1990. There may be a couple more. If, anyway, if you, if you put that picture up and then you ask the question, well, look at the picture and please tell me who actually has the power and the control to spend money, to sign contracts, to hire people, to create policy. It is mostly white people, which is why black people say to us, A, this is a white problem, and B, only white people can solve it. And that's, but we need you to understand because one of the things that's necessary in order for the country to go forward is for you to catch up with history because in 2040, the country is going to be majority minority. And if your businesses do not reflect the buying power of America, not only are you going to be unjust, but actually you're going to put your shareholders way behind. And so there is a moral imperative. There is a justice imperative. And by the way, there is a just it's better for everybody imperative and seize this moment. It is an invitation being being given to you because of these terrible consequences that were seen from George Floyd and Amon Arbery and Breonna Taylor, for you to get a window into COVID and the disparate impact on African-Americans, what can you not see now that you, that you couldn't see before? And now that you see it, now that you know it, now that you have the power, won't you move into this space with us? And so I'm with LeVar on this issue, that it is a somewhat of a challenge between um, the activist um, and let's just say the institutional leaders, and LeVar was telling us earlier today about the African-American mayors that are leading this out, because Dr. King said, you know, wait almost always means never. So there has to always be a constant push, but there's also a reality of how much can I actually do in a reasonably short period of time, and am I losing the long game? Rather than, that is a tactical issue that um, you have to actually think through. And people that are thinking through the nuts and bolts of it are not not allies. They're just sitting there thinking about, well, don't just tell me what to do. I've got to figure out how to do it. Who's going to pay for it? When is it going to get done? What's it going to look like when it's finished? Am I pushing too hard so that it'll break? Am I having a conversation that's going to end? How do I get to constructive engagement? And I think that we all have to think about how we occupy this space to actually keep pushing the country aggressively forward in a way that actually is sustainable over a long period of time and not reversible when the clap back that historically comes actually takes us 20 or 30 years back. That is a strategic decision that has to be made by thoughtful people who are thinking well of good faith, but are actually very practical. And I just think that's gonna take a little bit of work because I'm not sure that our muscle memory is really good enough to see that as clearly as as we would like to. And, and, and Lejeune, can I can I add real quick to what Mitch stated as well? Because I spoke a little bit about this when I was on a panel discussion uh, with uh, uh, black meeting planners and talking about the state of black tourism today. And I, I, I stated something that I think matches what, what Mitch says said as well, and that is. You know, people ask whether this is a racial reckoning. Are we in a racial reckoning right now? And there's a lot of optimism out there, particularly my generation, millennials, and those who are, who are, who are after us and the Gen Zers uh, as well. Uh, but this cannot just be a time for symbolism and tokenism, right? Mm -hmm. 
we have to do the work, right? You ha we have to do the work and we have to show the work as well. Because the test for me is when well, people say, well, is it a, this is a racial reckoning? I always reply back with, well, the proof will be in the pudding. Yeah. Right. If yeah. the gaps remain between black and white uh, as they are today in 2020 and 2030 in educational achievement in housing and generational wealth, if the boards of these institutions, uh, philanthropic or, or in the private sector, remain the same and not as diverse as they could be, or even in uh, our government institutions a decade from now, then I would say we've missed our moment, right? We yeah. missed our moment. This is, you know, my grandmother used to say, we get to make uh, hay while the sun is shining. The sun is shining today. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, dark clouds will come once again. We all know that. Uh, when Mitch said that there'll be a clapback one day, just like happened mm -hmm. after reconstruction, it will happen again. So we have to make hay while the sun is shining. And speaking of that, I'm going to turn to Jeff and have you double click and drill down a little bit on uh, the business community. We've seen the business community raise its consciousness on this issue, uh, but where do you think we are in the business community and what do we need from the business community as we move forward on this journey? Absolutely, I, I, this, I think this is super important and, and, and I wanna emphasize what Mayor Stoney said about sustained commitment, about how we gotta get out of this zero sum uh, thinking and what Mitch said about the importance of empowering leaders who don't look like them. What we need are leaders who recognize that all sectors of society have a responsibility to speak up and to act, to model leadership, especially in this environment where we're not getting it from the federal uh, government. And so that means corporate leaders have to, to to step up. You know, I grew up at Microsoft. Most of my career was building Microsoft Office. And we were taught to stick to our knitting. That's the way everybody kind of thought about things. If the company was doing well, if employees are happy, customers buying products, creating value for our shareholders, you know, why are people looking to me to solve societal problems? That was kind of a common way of thinking. But the good news is that's changing. Uh, a year ago, the Business Roundtable put out a statement that shocked the business world. It's not just about creating shareholder value. It's about the purpose of a corporation embracing all of the stakeholders. You know, I think a great example of somebody who models what I'm talking about is my friend Kevin Johnson, who's the CEO of Starbucks. He and I worked together at Microsoft many years, and he thinks his role the role of his fellow CEOs is not just creating value or creating an inclusive environment for employees and customers. It's an obligation to work on behalf of issues broadly. And he says it very succinctly. If society fails, we fail too. If society fails, we fail too. So the past few months, have really reminded us how interconnected we are. It's a, a critical time uh, for people to, to step up. I've appreciated uh, Mitch's leadership, uh, Mayor Stoney, but you know, here I'll say, you know, Mitch and I are the white guys on this. You know, our privilege continues, and it can't be the sole work of of communities of color to take on these issues and create a more equitable future. And so, you know, especially given what Mitch said about how white represented all of those aspects are of, of government, but also um, you know, what we see in the business world, we've got to have white leaders who step up and take the responsibility because if society fails, we fail too. Right, but Lejeune, let me, let me put, some, put some meat on these bones. And Mayor Stoney will oh, 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 see this really clearly. Like, you know, back in the 60s, everybody, white flight, everybody went out, white people went out to the suburbs, the inner cities, uh, predominantly African-American, not all of them, but many of them. And then the businesses stayed downtown, right? But the people who work in the businesses came from the suburbs. Now, I don't know what the taxing structure is in Mastoni's part, but generally speaking, the people that live in the city pay property taxes, which is one of the primary sources of funding. Folks that don't live in the city don't pay property taxes, but people that come into the city every day need police protection, fire protection, that this is a conservative argument for what we're talking about. Well, well, people who are getting services and are not paying for it, that's not a great thing. And it's creating a budget deficit. 
And by the way, the people that actually live in and around where the business is are not working in the business. And so there's just kind of this kind of crazy, simple idea, which is at 12 o'clock noon when the sun is highest um, and it's showing on that building, wherever the shadow of that building lands, anybody that's living in that shadow ought to be working in that building. In other words, that's how you that's how you sustain you, you sustain intense community engagement and the money coming out of that building ought to be going into investing in the neighborhoods that are in and around that area. That's not what's happening right now. It's actually the exact opposite. The buildings are downtown. The folks from outside are coming in. The tax base is going away. When the tax base goes away, the city has less revenue. From their perspective, they say, oh, gee, it's unsafe. And then the businesses leave and then you create this, this yeah. virtuous, I mean, this, 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 this cycle of disrepair. What you want to do is create a virtual cycle of investment where mm-hmm. everybody that lives in the shadow of that building, um, not just shareholders, but customers, and not only customers, but neighbors are participating from the wealth that's being generated by that particular entity. Now, just think about what the world would look like if in every city in America, all of the buildings where that is producing work and value is actually investing in housing, education, transportation, and all of a sudden you create a virtuous economic cycle that is second to none. And then you grow, we call this growing justice from the ground up as opposed to thinking about trickle down economics, which actually does the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of CEOs who, when they ask, what can I do? What's this got to do with me? How is, how is, I'm just building widgets. I'm building Microsoft, you know, whatever. They go, well, because if you thought about this and and you invested the right way, then you would produce, you would produce a much, much better outcome that would make everybody healthier and safety in, in every city in the country. Thank you, Mitch. We're, we're getting close to Q&A, but before we switch to q and I'm going to ask one last question of all of you. Um, you know, as we were listening to the last segment on truth, uh, we heard many times of the many opportunities we've had over the decades where we've come close to a breakthrough on these issues of race, and then there's this clawback. Uh, And then we go back to business as usual, and we move on. Um, Here's another moment. What's at stake in this moment if we don't do something very differently than we have in the past in these moments? And what does collective action look like in this moment so that we can be sure that we take this nation forward uh, and it sticks? this time. Anyone can start on that question, but uh, we have another moment and there have been many moments, but what's going to make the difference this time and what does collective action look like? I'll, I'll jump in and, and I'm sure everybody else will jump in as well. I think it, it's going to take leadership. Uh, I think what's beginning that push is was the people in the streets. The people in the streets are going to push their leaders to push the envelope, I think, right? Uh, but as Mitch came to my city and said the same thing, when our leaders push the envelope, you have to have their backs, right? Because uh, there is an entire agenda that must be fulfilled. And if the leader is not there to fulfill the rest of the agenda, then all of this ends up being for naught. So you got to have their backs when they're doing the bold, audacious thing as well. And we must you know, let the uh, past serve as prologue on this one as well. As I stated about Reconstruction in 1865, and you know, here in Virginia, we, had, uh, we were one of the first states out there with you know, a very um, uh, bringing people together. You know, we had African-Americans serving inside the, the legislature. Uh, I think Louisiana also follows suit as well. We had real leadership from the black and brown communities even back then. But then there was a clawback from then. There was a, it was a reaction. You know, every provocative uh, action has a provocative reaction as well. And that came for us was in 1902. They created this uh, constitution that essentially eliminated uh, the franchise for or disenfranchised black and brown people. We know what happened in the past. Let that serve as our guide for the future that uh, if this, if, if the work that's necessary right now doesn't happen, I think as a country, we lose our competitive edge. I really, really do. Uh, we lose our competitive edge and 
uh, in, in the global landscape, I think that means a lot to uh, Americans. And I think it means a lot to our institutions as well. Unfortunately, because of the leadership we've had over the course of the last four years, uh, if we don't rise to this moment, I think you're also see a lot of uh, the growing distrust in our institutions, right? And that to me is the beginning of, the, you know, of, of, of a crumbling democracy. We, we can't afford to have that this time around. So the biggest test comes November 3rd for a lot of us. Uh, there's a, a, big, a big test at the ballot box uh, that's uh, in front of us. And it, we can see collective change and collective action if we do the right thing. Right. Yeah, I just jump in on, on Mayor Stoney's comments. I mean, we, I, I see it in two dimensions. You know, now in the future, we are paying the price right now. Black people are dying from COVID, from police violence, from inadequate access to health care, from economic insecurity and, and wealth gaps. And, and finally, people are saying it's enough. You know, the murder of yet another black man uh, by the police kicked off an extraordinary moment for racial justice. People filled the streets all over the world, from Minneapolis to Berlin to small towns in Nebraska. You know, uh, my little hometown of, of 2,000 people had a protest of 40 people, you know, marching through the, the town. So we, we cannot let this, this energy fade and, and this ur urgency uh, fade. But I'll also point out, and, and this picks up on one of the points Mitch made, this is also significantly about our, our future. And Mayor Stoney made this as well. You know, back in, in February, I wrote a column about for Forbes about what white people need to know about black history and it really focused in on reconstruction. I now I need to write a column that says what white people need to know about their future. If in 2040 when the so-called demographic is majority minority, if we haven't figured out how to have an inclusive democracy, inclusive capitalism, then who's going to pay your social security? Who's going to fund the schools for, for, for your kids? I mean, this is where part of the people who in, really inspire me are Angela Glover Blackwell, formerly of PolicyLink, John Powell, uh, Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, the Othering and Belonging Institute. And what they point out is the importance of targeted universalism. The idea that we have to set aspirational goals for everyone but then we have to have targeted strategies to get there. That's what equity is about and what we need to do. And what you do is when you see that systems are broken and you design the solution for the people who are least well served, what you find out is actually not only do you help them, you probably help everybody else. And you know, so we, we need to really take this on for the present, uh, but also for the future. You know, I've been I've been a Democrat my whole life, and and uh, every Republican and conservative I know would you know identify me as a liberal, um, but I can actually make a conservative argument uh, for doing this. I don't really think that racism is a partisan issue. Um, some people like to try to make it be a partisan issue, and because um, so many people that self-identify as conservatives have racial issues that are overt in a in a, in a, in a very um, aggressive racial way um, that somehow we've conflated the issue that this is an ideological issue about being conservative and liberal. Um, the, the, we can argue in America, um, people who are conservative and liberal about whether government should be big or small, whether or not to push the economy forward or through for tax cuts for the rich or building it from the ground up like I would advocate. We can talk about um, you know a whole bunch of ways that government should or should not work with the business community, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems to me that the most American idea that exists, the central idea of who we are as Americans is that we all come to the table of democracy as equals. This isn't a Republican or a Democratic or a liberal or conservative idea. This is like the most uniquely American idea that has existed in the history of the world. And I don't think it's, a, it's an ideological problem to say that we've never really gotten that right. That's first. Yeah. Second, it doesn't seem to be very thoughtful or conservative to keep spending a lot of money on the back end that, that costs three times as much and not on the front end in terms of investment. No business person that I know would, would spend time maintaining things, I mean, fixing things that they never spent any money investing in 
to begin with or spend more money on something that costs less and get a worse result. And then finally, I don't know a business person in the world who would ever advocate that they actually disregard the most essential thing that every business and every government needs, and that is human capital. Four million people got expelled from the South. Isabel Wilkerson, in her book, The Warmth of Mother Sun, says this so beautifully. And in her, in her latest book on caste, in the last chapter, she really kind of drills down on this notion that, you know, wow, if a, if, a wonder, if a single person can change the world, then the absence of people, the absence of human capital, the absence of investment has to dramatically limit what the United States of America could do. So as Americans see themselves competing with the rest of the world, why would we want to compete without investing in the human capital that is so necessary to build intellectual capital, creative talent? So when I say the best is yet to come for America, it can't be anything but that. And we can't get to that unless we make sure that every American citizen, irrespective of race, creed, or color, yeah. has that opportunity. And we have been, we, we have just been recalcitrant in our, in our desire to see that and been blinded by it. And there's so there's such a much better day coming for us when we make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate. That seems to me to be a uniquely American and patriotic uh, approach to this issue that is not ideologically based, which is why, you know, I want to invite every white person in America to come into this conversation, to be aware of it and do what is necessary in order to, to kind of form, as we like to say, uh, that more perfect union that we always every day are marching towards. And that has to be our North Star. Thank you, Mitch. And I just want to add that uh, we produced a report from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation called The Business Case for Racial Equity. And we've actually quantified that number. Uh, and it's $8 trillion by 2050 if we bring every one of our capable citizens back into the workforce. That's an additional $8 trillion in gross domestic product. So, yes, it's real money. And that's not money to leave on the table. And it isn't. It isn't a partisan rationale. It is a survival. It's a, a growth rationale. So thank you for that. I'm going to ask uh, one last question from the audience. And I think it's perfect as we're talking about the partisanship, the partisanness of, of these questions. How did they get there? We don't know. But I do have a question for you after the upcoming presidential election. And no matter how it comes out, how are we actually going to begin to restore the soul of our nation and build trust. This is coming from the audience. Anyone want to begin to talk about well, what do I, we do after November 3rd? I'll touch, I'll touch it uh, quickly and, and, and leave um, LeVar uh, and Jeff just to end it. Um, I think it depends, quite frankly. I think President Trump um, has decided wrongfully um, to racialize everything that is occurring in the country and is not leading us in the right direction. So should he win again and should he continue? And his attorney general and other cabinet members begin to uh, and continue to be antagonistic about the idea of institutional racism, I think the rest of us have to do the work anyway. Um, and we cannot wait on them. We have to continue to move forward. And the business leaders of America don't need the president's permission, um, neither do governors and neither do mayors. Uh, neither do community leaders. We can do the work uh, on our own, although it's going to be much harder. Um, if President Biden uh, uh, is elected and um, Vice President Kamala Harris, and they help lead um, and create the environment and create the opportunity of cooperation between the government, the business sector, federal, state, and local, and we move forward, you know, in a, in a thoughtful, intentional way towards an outcome that can be seen. I think the work is going to take on uh, a, a different meaning and a different moment and a different urgency. Thank you. And, and I'll, I'll add that if President, if Vice President Biden is elected president alongside Kamala Harris as vice president, obviously they're not going to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. Uh, so the same advice that I got from my grandmother, I would probably give to them. However, they have to lead uh, with their heart uh, and lead and do what's what's right for on behalf of our country. And I think what's been missing over the course of the last four years 
is someone who's going to work towards uniting us, particularly in the occasions where all we need, and sometimes we need to grieve together, we need to mourn together, and we haven't had that in the president over the last four years. You know, we as a country come together during crisis. We come together in our most vulnerable times. And right now we are within the within that moment. And we haven't had a leader bring us all together saying, you know what, we're all in this together. All right. So we need a uniter. Uh, we've had someone who's doubled down on the playbook of division, doubled down on uh, the playbook of uh, uh, exclusion. And if uh, if they can lead in that sort of way, bringing us together, particularly in the moments when we need it the most, mass shootings, uh, a, a public health crisis, that to me is going to uh, go far. It's going to help a lot of people uh, come together and I think get behind the agenda. That's what we're, I think that's what the world, what the world, yes, the world, the globe is yearning for that sort of leadership. Yeah, I completely agree with Mitch and, and Mayor Stoney. I mean, we, we, there's a tough road ahead either way in the presidential election, there's a tough road ahead. You know, we we have seen, as Mayor Stoney said, the most divisive president that I remember in my adult life. I mean, and and you don't you don't just correct for that uh, uh, by December. Uh, and but if Vice President Biden gets elected with Kamala Harris. They have a tough road ahead because it's going to take time to repair all the damage that has been done. We as a country are at our best when we are true to our values. And these last four years do not bespeak of that kind of commitment. We have to get back to that. And that's going to take, that's going to really take some some time, but we've got to be true to our values. I do share the kind of optimism that Mitch expressed about what this country can be. We are far from perfect, but if we are true to our values and we move forward toward trying to build a more perfect union, then I think we can get there. It's going to take time. And if uh, President Trump gets reelected, uh, by gosh, I hope business leaders stand up, local and state leaders stand up, uh, communities, organized communities stand up so that we can get back to being true to our values. Yes, and uh, just a final thought for all of you. I'm going to ask you all, you're such great leaders, uh, very, very quickly. As you're passing the baton to the youth of our nation, and we're seeing our youth step into their own leadership uh, roles, what advice and how are you thinking about a pipeline uh, for those for our youth and in the next generation of leaders? Jeff, I'll start with you, and then I'll end with uh, Mitch to close us out. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll be very succinct here. Two things: prop them up and get out of their way. Uh, I, have, I have great hope for our young people. The young people quite obviously are the future of our country. And hopefully they will learn from uh, the good things we've done, but the number of mistakes that we've made, we can provide those insights, but they need to be supported and then you know, let's get out of their way because I do believe that they represent what I was saying earlier about aspiring to the values of what this country can and should be. And so let's prop them up and get out of their way. Right. Uh, I think Jeff is 100% correct. We need to get out of the way. Uh, sometimes I think elected leaders stay in office way too long. Uh, that's happened for generations. There's probably been a generation or two that was skipped before it got to me. And I think we do well when we have fresh new ideas brought to the fore. And that means that, you know, leaders like myself, even I, I'm 39, I'm not super old, Mitch, um, but we have to, we have to mentor, right? There's somebody in college today or graduated from the university that we should mentor and, and show them how to, uh, how to navigate uh, all this. And so that's what I'm going to work on in my time. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Mitch. Lejeune, thank you. I think Jeff's got it right. You got to lift them up and let them go. I am really excited about a new, new generation of leaders. They, 
they seem to be, to me, to be really engaged, really focused, and very purposeful. Um, and understanding that they have a future that they're going to have to build for themselves because uh, they think their elders have not done it as well for them. I think they see the country's potential and they actually believe the stuff that we taught them about the Constitution and the promise of America. And they're holding us accountable and they want to hold themselves accountable, too. So I'm excited to see what the future brings. Very hopeful, very optimistic. But as Jeff said, we got a lot of hard work to do. This is not easy. And you got to put your shoulder to the wheel and, and make it happen. Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with all of you. It's been uh, just a wonderful, refreshing uh, conversation to hear such wisdom from great leaders. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Landrieu. And if you could just uh, close us out, just thank you for inviting all of us. This well, Jim, thank you so much for moderating the great panel. As my grandmother would say, you know, the, the most six important words are I for, uh, I'm sorry uh, and I forgive you. And that is what's going to bring reconciliation about so that we can move into then what's next. And we all have to have this national conversation that takes us through the issue of race. We can't go over it, can't go around it, uh, can't go under it. We have to go through it. And so, uh, Lejeune, I want to thank you, Jeff, Mayor Stoney, for a great conversation to kick off this series. We look forward to have everybody join us next Thursday for our conversation on criminal justice that will be led by the great Bakari Sellers. We will see you then. Thanks so much and have a great day.